From the time we're children, we're wildly creative growing up. Children don't have a problem coming up with new ideas. Ask a four-year-old what they want to be when they grow up, or what's the most important thing in life. You'll see what I mean. Picasso said it this way, all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. But what happens to us as children to stop taking risks? What kills that creativity? It's hard to find a better answer than from Sir Ken Robinson and his famous TED Talk. My contention is all kids have tremendous talents and we squander them pretty ruthlessly. I had a great story recently, uh, I love telling it, of a little girl who was uh, in a drawing lesson. She was six and she was at the back drawing and the, the teacher said this little girl hardly ever paid attention. And in this drawing lesson she did. And uh, the teacher was fascinated. She went over to her and she said, what are you drawing? And the girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the girl said, they will in a minute. <laughs> Kids will take a chance. You know, if they don't know, they'll have a go. Am I right? They're not frightened of being wrong. Now, I don't mean to say that being wrong is the same thing as being creative. What we do know is, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. If you're not prepared to be wrong. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. Uh, they have become frightened of being wrong. And we run our companies this, by the way. We stigmatize mistakes. And we're now running national education systems where mistakes are the worst thing you can make. And the result is that we are educating people out of their creative capacities. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is that many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not. Because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. Without taking risks, we never come up with anything original. Which means creativity requires risk taking. It isn't for the weak, it isn't for the timid. Creativity thrives in the lives of those who are courageous risk takers. Which is why I want to talk to you about creativity and risk taking today. Welcome. I'm Joel Pelsu, president of Arts and Entertainment Ministries, where we mentor artists and creative professionals to succeed creatively and grow spiritually. If God's called you into a creative career, you need to know that you're not alone. We have videos, courses, blogs, all online created just for you. You can find them by using the links down below. You may ask, why do we do this? We do this to encourage and equip you so you have confidence working as a Christian in the mainstream art world, media, or entertainment industry, even in video game production. Whether you live in a small market or work remotely, or if you live in a major market like here in LA, New York, London, Paris, Mumbai, whatever it is. Now, before we jump in, I want to thank you for taking time to watch this video and ask one favor, you know what to do. Hit the like button and click on the subscribe bar. It really makes a difference, helps other people find this content, get that exposure so we can equip more people. Thank you so much for doing that. Creativity requires risk taking because to do anything creative is to take a risk. A risk of rejection, a risk of misunderstanding, and a risk of being criticized. But taking the risk is worth it because beyond the risk is where the real reward lies. The reward of greater art, greater success, and the reward of a deeper, more meaningful life. See, anytime you begin to express or create something new and present it to others, there is a hope of success and the risk of rejection. Can I take new risks and new chances in our art or our life without being vulnerable? It's part of who we are as people made in the image of God. But to really understand our vulnerability and the deep value of taking risks and how to face that, we need to understand where vulnerability comes from and how to address it in all of life. You can't escape it. So the best thing to do is learn how to address it, examine it clearly, and face it head on. Best-selling author Madeline Lengel wrote, When we were children, we used to think that when we were grown up, we would no longer be vulnerable. But to grow up is to accept vulnerability. Now, you can play it safe when you're a child. You can start by copying and imitating the artists who have gone before. That's how it works. That's how it begins. You learn by imitating what has worked for the greats and have gone before. You may learn about great filmmakers and painters and performers. Imitate their art and their techniques. But if you remain in a state of imitating others, you fail to grow up. Maturity in life, as in art, requires putting our hearts out there and taking risks with our own lives, our own relationships, and the art we create. God, think about this, was vulnerable 
in his creation. And this is the model I want to talk about so we understand the very nature of our vulnerability and what it means to take risks and how that comes from being made in the image of God. God was fine without us, without the animals, water, land, and universe. He didn't create out of need. He created because he desires something that required risk. We usually focus on how the sin in the Garden of Eden impacted Adam and Eve and the rest of humanity. But what about God? What did he feel and experience in that moment? He poured himself into creating this great work of art, the world, and then he created man and woman, the height of the creation. He took a risk and it became a bitter pill. Adam and Eve were vulnerable and unashamed initially when he made them before they sinned. There was no risk. The creativity is flowing. There's freedom. Adam and Eve were vulnerable. They were naked, unashamed. It was in this state they were called to create. Specifically, they were called to procreate. The most vulnerable act in the most vulnerable bodily expression is the one that produces the most amazing results. It's such a picture of vulnerability and creativity. It is here in the beginning of Genesis that we see our ability to create is tied to our willingness to be vulnerable. See, when Adam and Eve were walking in the garden and God comes, there was no sin. There's no reason to hide, no risk of being rejected or judged. That's why the Bible tells us they were naked and unashamed. It's making a point. This is what we long for and what we were designed for. It's what we look forward to experiencing in the New Jerusalem, where personal and creative freedom will soar beyond what we can now imagine because we will have no anxiety, no shame, no fear. It will be amazing. Unfortunately, once Adam and Eve ate the apple and sinned, vulnerability became unnatural. Now it was taking a risk to be vulnerable. It was terrifying. The vulnerability we needed in order to create and develop new ideas is now anxiety producing. It can't be avoided. It is woven into the fabric of reality. Where all was well, there's now a fear of others being critical, withdrawing, or criticizing. Like an artist worried about the critics and the audience, a symbol of the emotional and psychological defense mechanisms are those fig leaves of Adam and Eve. This is what they used to protect their hearts. Innocence was gone and shame was now present. New opportunities for discovery and creativity would not come without a cost. The risk-taking cost of shame. The God of love comes to meet us in our shame. When God's walking around the garden, it says, Where are you? To Adam and Eve. It's not because he didn't know where they are. <laughs> he wasn't unaware of their location. He was inviting them back to come clean, to be vulnerable, to resist the shame and reconnect with the God who loves them. God does not abandon them their shame. He didn't storm away in some epic temper tantrum. No, God did the most surprising, most loving thing he could do. He pursued them. God pursued them in order to establish deeper intimacy. He called them back to the vulnerability and creativity they had experienced before. It's important to notice we are tempted to spend our time in the information age pursuing knowledge about all kinds of things. But what we really need is to be known. And to be known is to be vulnerable and enter into deeper intimacy with others. We're hardwired for intimacy. And we're hardwired in a way that there is no cheat code, there is no shortcut. The only path to healing is to be known, and complete joy is to be completely known. This should be a significant goal of all healthy churches, community groups, ministries. Unfortunately, I've rarely seen it outside of my few visits with friends at 12-step groups and in Los Angeles at a chapter of Celebrate Recovery where I spoke. It seems like most of us need to hit bottom before we will face the agony of shame and push through until we find real intimacy, hope, and joy. And this is why we find such comfort in verses like James 4.8. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Jesus endured shame. Jesus is teaching us that shame must not have the last word. Picture this. Jesus was naked, mocked, betrayed, and then crucified. Any other man would resist the shame, but Jesus, it tells us in Hebrews 12, 2, scorned the shame of the cross as he focused on the glory of overcoming death. He was exposed for all to see, but Jesus did not allow the shame to define him. He listened to the voice of his father saying, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. He knew that what he was called to do, and he knew that the suffering he was going through was necessary before accomplishing the final victory. Here's the point. Satan wants to cripple your imagination. 
He wants to destroy your creativity and disintegrate your very heart and soul and isolate you from others. And shame is the tool of choice. This is why shame tells us we are not valuable and tells us the story that we will never be loved, understood, or embraced the way that we long to be. So give up. Jesus shows us how to maintain our identity in the Father's love. He heals our shame. See, the greatest example of this is in John 21. When Jesus restores Peter after he has denied Christ, Peter failed epically. And in John 21, verses 15 to 17, Jesus shows us how he loves Peter. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus doesn't leave Peter in his failure and in his shame. He pursues Peter, speaks to his soul, and restores him, letting him, instead of deny him three times, now proclaim his love for him three times. Jesus does not believe that our failures define us. He shows us that our failure can become an opportunity for deeper love and an opportunity for restoration and a deeper relationship. See, our shame wants to tell the story of abandonment, isolation, and rejection. And this cripples our creativity as well as our emotional and spiritual life. It makes us fear that we can never recover from our shame. But Jesus tells us a different story, and it's the story we must remember and recall when we're discouraged. The story we hear from Jesus is one of hope. He calls us to choose vulnerability, as he did, so we can find deeper and richer relationships. And it's only in that context that we're fully known and thus fully alive. This is where creativity thrives, because your brain is no longer taxed by your fears, your anxieties, and your doubts. And what we really need, we need great worship, great sermons, great fellowship, but those are not enough. What we really need are confessional communities where we can drop the facade, be honest with other people, two, three, four other people, and let others join us in confession, in forgiveness, in encouragement, so we can be known and find healing. The author and uh, psychologist Kurt Thompson in his book, Soul of Shame, said this so succinctly, we can love God, love ourselves and love others only to the degree that we are known by God and known by others. It's great to listen to sermons and read books, but we need to be known, not just know more doctrine, more theology, more practice. We need to love the poor, we need to do those things, and we need to be known. Then we can breathe deeper, relax more fully, and begin to dream and imagine more richly. This is where our fountain of creativity is meant to emerge. Creativity requires risk-taking, just as our deeper need for spiritual growth requires vulnerability and risk-taking. We ought not to be satisfied with taking mere creative risks. Let's go deeper. Do the soul work we desperately need and take risks in our relationships, in our spiritual walk with God, in our community groups. This is the grand journey that will nourish our souls and inspire our art. Creativity requires risk-taking, and there's no way around it. We can't go under, over, or find a shortcut. God invites you to intimacy with Him so you will have greater spiritual vibrancy and influence, and so that your art will be more poignant, more creative, and possess greater spiritual depth. So be brave. Have confidence in the love your God has for you. Be vulnerable in a healthy way, in a healthy confessional community, and take risks because the God of the universe loves you and is for you. Now, I want to ask you a favor. Can you share down below how have risks been pivotal in your creative life? What risks have you taken? What were you afraid of? How did you push through that? How have you overcome the fears we all face in risk taking? I want to know that in the comments and let other artists and creatives see that so they can be encouraged from your stories. As always, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Helps other people find it. Check the links down below to find out about our online courses, 
our blog, other resources we have. Even our uh, devotionals, if you sign up for our emails, you get a special Monday morning devotional you can't get anywhere else. So sign up for that. Don't forget, give me your comments about facing fears and taking risks in your life. And may God bless you and continue to draw you closer to Him as you take those risks. God bless. Thank you.